Um, good afternoon and welcome to this EPC online briefing. Uh, my name is Marta Pilati. I am policy analyst at the EPC, where I cover economic and regional policy and the EU budget. Um, I have the pleasure today to moderate a discussion with Mark Lemet, uh, Director General of DG Regio, the DG for Regional and uh, Urban Policy. Uh, Mark has been Director General since uh, 2016, and before he has been Chief of Cabinet for several commissioners, including for regional policy. Uh, thank you for being here, Mark, uh, for discussing with us today about EU regions and, and the future of, of cohesion policy. Um, before we start, um, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, this event will last uh, one hour, so until uh, 5.30. Um, it will be an interactive discussion, uh, which I will moderate. Um, the audience can actively participate in this. Uh, you can uh, make a point or ask a question in two ways. Uh, there is a Q&A box where you can type in your question um, and then I will, I will read it out loud. Uh, please keep it short so that I can read it uh, quite easily. The other way for you to ask a question um, orally is to uh, click on the raise hand button. This is quite small at the bottom of the participants list. Um, so let's, let's kick off. Um, we are clearly in a highly uncertain time. Um, we have a a very big economic crisis that is uh, foreseen, but the scale is still unclear, um, as is unclear the future development of this pandemic. Um, COVID has brought to the surface existing inequalities within the EU and has also the potential of exacerbating some of them. Um, the pandemic and the crisis have impacted different countries and different regions in different ways, uh, with vulnerable areas struggling to cope. Um, following the Commission's proposals in May, the European Council has agreed in July on a recovery package that is worth 750 billion uh, next generation EU, which is now in the process of being negotiated with the European Parliament um, and is, its approval can be expected relatively soon. The next seven year budget, the MFF, the Multiannual Financial Framework, is also being negotiated at this very time and will start in January 2021. Um, but the EU is not only confronted with the health and the economic crisis, these are also years of structural transformation towards a more sustainable, a digital economy and society. In all of these developments, cohesion policy will play a crucial role as the main investment tool of the Euro European budget. The explicit goal of cohesion policy is to enhance economic, social and territorial cohesion to reduce the development disparities across EU regions. But recently, it has also been seen as the major way to channel investment for digitalization and greening of activities. Um, today at this briefing, we discuss uh, the effects of the COVID crisis on the EU regions, the challenges related to the green and digital transitions, and how cohesion policy can uh, play a role uh, in supporting EU regions through these developments. As I mentioned, the new cohesion policy will start on the 1st of January, so just in a few months. And today we'll discuss what is new and what we can expect uh, for the next seven years. Um, but Mark, before we talk about today and tomorrow, um, I suggest we start by taking, taking stock of past achievements. Uh, we are at the end almost of 2020, which is the end of the current uh, cohesion policy. We started in 2014. So seven years later, 350 billion euros available for investment. What conclusions can we draw? What are the accomplishments, accomplishments and what were the challenges uh, that you think were, were encountered? Thank you. Thanks, Marta, and thank you very much to, uh, to you and to the EPC for, for having invited me uh, today. I think it's, um, uh, it's, it's a very uh, timely exchange we can have today, and I would also want, in fact, this to be uh, very interactive. And if you uh, don't mind uh, me being a bit uh, undisciplined, uh, because I would want, indeed, to, to have as much exchange as possible, um, 
I would want simply to start by three messages, because I think it's more important to turn to the future than, uh, uh, than to turn to the past, um, given that we live, as you said, in very uncertain times. And we should try, as public policymakers, uh, to create a sense of stability and of clarity of, uh, of direction altogether. So let me start very classically by suggesting three messages which uh, are addressed, uh, of course, to public policymakers, um, but also uh, to, uh, to private sector actors. The first message is there is no time to waste. Um, uncertain times call for um, uh, bold and decisive actions. You have mentioned the uh, very much waited for um, agreement at the level of European leaders on uh, a historic um, uh, response capacity uh, in the form of a recovery package for uh, for the European Union. Um, it is good to um, emphasize that this package will represent, in fact, uh, a doubling of the EU budget as compared uh, to uh, normal uh, times uh, over the coming six years. So this is a, a very meaningful uh, quantitative uh, response, which uh, it seems has created some um, has produced some confidence boost generally uh, across Europe, but we should uh, not be reassured by that because this would fizzle out quite quickly if we don't now uh, put all of this uh, into uh, into practice. There is a lot of work to do uh, on the side of European institutions so that indeed real money can start flowing um, uh, if we don't waste any time somewhere in the second quarter of uh, next year. This might, in fact, already sound quite late. So this is why I emphasize again the, um, uh, the urgency of all this. What we are seeing uh, today is a lot of um, uh, goodwill, a lot of uh, motivation on all sides, and this is why, um, uh, seeing it from the side of the European Commission, we are very um, uh, very encouraged and uh, and somewhat confident that no time will be wasted there. There is um, uh, also a need for member states themselves to really waste no time in reflecting strategically on what will be um, enormous means in certain cases which they will have at their disposal. And um, uh, about which they will have a high degree of freedom um, to um, to um, orient them uh, to concrete uh, public and and support to private uh, investments. Um, we are talking about very many instruments. Cohesion policy, as you said, is uh, a um, uh, a big. Uh, chunk uh, within that overall picture, uh, but there are uh, many more. If we take all the instruments which member states uh, will have at their disposal over uh, the coming uh, six years, um, we they, these instruments represent altogether for a country like Bulgaria or a country like Croatia around 30% of their GNI. This is more than massive, and it is something which uh, they um, uh, will have to uh, decide how to put it to best use um, over um, the very next years. This is why a sound strategic reflection uh, is, uh, is essential so that these um, uh, extremely um, uh, powerful means are put to the best use. I mentioned Bulgaria and Croatia, uh, but uh, this this level of support, um, of financial support to individual member states is not uh, an exception for these two countries. We have another nine member states who would 
uh, receive a support of more than 20 percent of their uh, of their GNIs um, over uh, the the coming uh, years. Um, just a yeah a half look back, but which is also a look forward. Uh, you mentioned the present uh, period. In fact, what comes on top of that uh, is uh, more or less half of cohesion policy means, which were foreseen in 2014, 2020, which member states uh, still need uh, to uh, uh, to transform uh, into concrete uh, implementation. The Commission has. Uh, worked flat out to provide member states with uh, useful reference points for this strategic uh, reflection. Um, the, the last case in point is uh, the guidance which we have provided to member states for them uh, to uh, think about um, the use of the um, recovery and resilience facility. Uh, and more specifically for developing uh, their recovery and resilience plans. Um, we had already quite a while ago, uh, starting in 2019 as part of the European semester process, um, given shared with member states our thinking on uh, member state specific uh, priorities uh, for cohesion policy in the future, uh, back in 2019, and for the uh, more recent proposal we made for a just transition fund to help regions which will uh, go through uh, a delicate um, <clears throat> climate-related uh, transition process, uh, we made such or such um, we shared such um, orientations uh, this year in 2020. So member states have, I think, um, full clarity by now on the rules of the game, on the amounts which will be available to them under different uh, instruments under the EU budget. Uh, and so um, uh, they um, uh, really uh, should now turn to this concrete strategic thinking. Second message. Um, Within that strategic thinking, what should they um, not overlook? The second message would be think long term. If I can start by two quotes from uh, President von der Leyen from her State of the European Union speech, uh, which um, she made uh, last week. The first one. Um, was build the world we want to live in. That is, I think, um, the right motto uh, to inspire um, the use of European uh, budget support. And secondly, propel ourselves in the world of tomorrow. This to us means very clearly uh, that um, we should clearly focus on our long-term challenges. Um, and these are uh, quite centrally the green transition, which um, incorporates, of course, our climate objectives. And as you know, um, we have proposed, and President von der Leyen has announced it in the State of the Union speech, uh, to raise our ambition for the uh, intermediate targets uh, in 2030 to reduce uh, carbon emissions by 55% at least uh, by, uh, by then. Uh, but the green transition is also, as part of the European Green Deal, about generally ens ensuring higher environmental sustainability. So this includes biodiversity, it includes um, the recycling uh, of um, uh, of uh, primary materials. Um, secondly, uh, just as obviously, uh, there is the uh, digital transformation, uh, which uh, we need to continue to pursue in an accelerated way. Uh, this is not just, and I would say not even mainly, about um, uh, broadband infrastructure or 5G infrastructure. It is much, much more than that. And there again, I would um, uh, draw your attention uh, to what uh, uh, President von der Leyen uh, said uh, last week in more, in more detail. And it is, 
you know, think long term. It is about um, boosting uh, innovation um, uh, in Europe. Uh, this has been uh, quite a um, uh, uh, quite a constant challenge uh, in Europe over the past uh, uh, decades. Our research and uh, innovation um, um, uh, efforts um, lag a bit behind uh, main uh, competitors uh, in, in the world, and certainly we would continue to put enormous focus on that. Um, the cohesion policy reform we had proposed back in 2018 uh, and which is now coming uh, to its uh, conclusion, um, uh, already embedded all of this with some clear refocusing on these uh, three uh, dimensions. Um, to conclude on this second message, I would say that um, we have all we need. We have clear objectives. Uh, climate is one case in, uh, in point. Uh, and we have the means, and we have unprecedented means uh, and possibly means which will not repeat themselves um, uh, that soon, which will be available uh, in the decade which is now uh, opening. So this next decade has to be a decisive decade uh, for transition. Um, the third and last message I would uh, share uh, is that um, we should be obsessed with leaving no one and no region behind. Um, here we have a, um, a conflagration. We have on the one hand the very sharp economic downturn you referred to um, in your introduction, even though perhaps the downturn will be slightly uh, less harsh than we expected two or three months ago. Still, it will be of quite unprecedented proportions, deeper than the 2009 economic crisis. And uh, in all likelihood, our economies will not have returned to their pre-crisis levels before 2022. So this is a clear indication that um, this crisis will lead to uh, serious scars of a social nature, but also of a territorial uh, nature. Um, secondly, we are talking about these indispensable transitions over the coming decade. Well, transitions mean accelerated change, and accelerated change means that there are some people who come out winners of that, and there are some people who come out losers of that. So taking all this together, we have um, a very high risk of uh, what I think Commissioner Gentiloni uh, coined a great fragmentation uh, within Europe, both at the social level and at the territorial level. And this is why we should really be obsessed, and member states, authorities in particular, when thinking strategically um, about um, implementing the uh, recovery package, um, we should be obsessed about making the recovery as inclusive as uh, possible. Um, we have the Just Transition Fund, which is focused exactly on that. Uh, and I mention this because it is one of those new instruments. And it is focused specifically on the climate transition. It is aimed to help those regions which will need in a more significant way than others to move out abandon certain economic uh, activities on which they rely today uh, so that they can, through special support, um, invent a uh, new future for, for themselves. Um, we certainly have that normally embedded in the DNA of cohesion policy uh, as well, uh, but member states having quite a bit of freedom uh, of 
uh, where they can uh, spend cohesion policy uh, on their territories, I think it is important again to emphasize uh, the uh, the goal of um, uh, inclusiveness uh, and uh, a uh, balanced uh, territorial um, development. Um, we have specifically in cohesion policy, and that would be my last um, uh, element, um, a tradition and a, um, I think, in such difficult times, essential uh, practice of bringing in um, partners in the policy design uh, phase, um, be it public, regional, and local authorities, be it uh, public or private actors um, at uh, regional and local level. And um, in order to have the right strategic thinking, which is required now, certainly all these actors should be uh, brought into uh, the discussion. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Mark, for this for this very comprehensive uh, three messages, um, which were very clear. Um, no time to waste, longer thinking, and and leaving no one behind. Um, I want to pick up on many things you've mentioned, um, but first I'll pick up on the last thing you said: uh, the fact of being that we have to be obsessed with this idea of inclusivity of um, reducing um, inequalities. Um, and, and, and I'm pleased to, to, to hear you say this because I, I, I me sometimes have the feeling that this is somewhat left on the margins, especially when we talk about uh, competitiveness, for example. Um, um, the fact that the EU, uh, when it comes to innovation, for example, new technologies needs to be at the frontier of these new, new developments. Um, that sometimes um, doesn't necessarily consider the fact that not everyone can be um, a top player, but that everyone needs to be included uh, nonetheless. Um, and so I wanted to ask um, about harmony uh, between and among EU policies. Uh, we have cohesion policy that is as, as, a, as a treaty objective has cohesion in mind and cohesiveness. Um, but how does this uh, relate to other policies, for example, the industrial strategy, digital policy? Um, do you see a risk of um, um, a risk of uh, disalignment, uh, maybe, or at least not expressed enough? Um, do you see the need for a refocusing, for a stronger, maybe, sensitiveness to uh, regional challenges across all EU policies? Uh, or maybe this is done already, or, or what can change, um, especially as we go through uh, fundamental and structural transformations that you have mentioned uh, when it comes to energy, to climate change action, um, and to digitalization? These are, um, yeah, very um, relevant um, comments, potential. Um, um, objections or tensions you would see uh, in, um, uh, in, in the overall uh, policy toolbox of the EU and, and some possible internal inconsistencies. Um, I must say, I do not see uh, such uh, inconsistencies. Um, the Europe is in a globalized world. Um, wants to be open, uh, wants to have fair rules, obviously, overall, but certainly does not want to withdraw from, um, uh, from the world. And therefore, we do need uh, to uh, be ambitious. And we do need, as President von der Leyen said, to shape the world, not only shape uh, Europe. And for that, you need, you need to be uh, the first mover, you need to be a leader. And this is what we certainly, uh, I think, quite convincingly uh, are doing right now when it comes to the uh, climate uh, challenge. And it is part of um, an agenda to um, also reap the benefits of being the first mover, 
of being the first one to develop certain technologies, which then will be embraced uh, progressively uh, by, um, uh, by others. Um, so I do not see there any kind of um, um, contradiction between um, Europe being at the front of the pack, being among the most competitive, um, and Europe at the same time uh, being uh, inclusive. If we if we look at um, uh, the member states which are considered the most competitive, the most innovative, uh, we have uh, uh, always among the top five: um, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Netherlands, uh, which uh, I think uh, quite. Uh, uh, um, convincingly, are very inclusive societies, um, uh, very uh, equal uh, societies. Um, industrial strategy. This is another good um, uh, good reference point. Um, if we take um, a recent, I would call it industrial project, which has been um, uh, spearheaded by the European Commission, uh, if I remember well, two or three years ago, uh, the so-called battery alliance. What we were saying, what we were seeing, uh, while being um, again the the greatest um, uh, proponents of uh, decisive climate action, was that uh, probably one key technology for uh, achieving climate neutrality in the long term, uh, i.e. the stocking of electricity or the electrification of a lot of uh, processes, um, that these technologies were totally escaping us uh, and we were um, um, uh, nearly entirely reliant uh, on external uh, providers. So we launched this battery alliance with the uh, private sector uh, in order uh, to regain some uh, lost ground and to hopefully um, uh, move back uh, to the front um, and ahead of the curve uh, on more sustainable also uh, battery technologies in, in the future. Why do I mention this example? Because now we are seeing under cohesion policy that some member states have in fact identified projects um, to contribute to the batteries alliance which they will be financing through cohesion policy support and this is perfect i mean one case uh, where if i need to mention one member state it is um, it is poland uh, so uh, here we can see that in fact a part of the EU toolbox called cohesion policy helps all member states, including those um, which uh, today have some lesser uh, means of their own, to participate in a common uh, industrial uh, strategy and therefore uh, not to be uh, left on the, um, uh, on the sidelines. Um, thank you. And on this, I want to uh, bring a question that we, we got from the audience by uh, Dimitri Korpakis, who is asking um, about smart specialization in particular and how uh, what role this will have in the future, also in relation to the industrial strategy more broadly. Um, the first, um, first, I would like to share um, a worry. Uh, quite a deep worry of, of mine, um, which is that um, innovation uh, would uh, fall short under cohesion policy support uh, over uh, the coming uh, decade, because it would have been uh, sidelined, overlooked uh, uh, in the uh, emergence of more um, immediate short-term needs. And this is why I mentioned innovation uh, under this um, uh, second message, think long-term. If we think long-term, I think 
innovation will not be forgotten. If we think short term, innovation might be forgotten over the coming few years, and that would be a very uh, grave uh, mistake. Uh, smart specialization um, is um, remains a, um, a very fresh, a very novel way uh, of um, mobilizing uh, innovative capacity at the local and uh, regional uh, level. And we believe that um, it, is, uh, it is the right um, approach to ensure that um, all parts of Europe, even the less developed parts, um, adopt this mindset. We cannot have in Europe, a mindset of, um, well, a, a conservative mindset of just, you know, relying uh, and remaining with what we with what we have. The world is moving on. We need to adjust. We know our ways are as they are today are not sustainable. So in any event, we need uh, we need to adjust. And on top of it, um, in order to remain relevant and to uh, remain the continent probably with overall uh, the highest quality uh, of life, we need to embrace technologies uh, and, and technological evolution. And this is why it is so crucial for um, all regions in Europe uh, to be open to innovation uh, and to see it as, um, in fact, a lifeline to the future rather than uh, as a threat. Smart specialization strategies are there to help um, organize a fruitful discussion dialogue between all the regional uh, actors, which was not happening spontaneously in most parts of Europe. Um, and we are very, um, uh, uh, very happy and very encouraged by how um, the introduction of this uh, method uh, has picked up uh, across uh, Europe. And we certainly would hope that the next period will really, um, uh, will, will really um, uh, harness the, uh, the potential of that, um, uh, of that approach. Now, where I would make a distinction um, is between these smart specialization strategies and some um, main components of a European industrial strategy, which we would have. Uh, for instance, yes, batteries alliance. Not every region in Europe needs to have um, uh, a, back a battery production uh, facility. Uh, not every region in Europe has to be involved uh, in any way, in fact, uh, with, uh, with battery uh, production. What every region in Europe has to be involved in is in capturing the opportunities of technologies. And I mentioned digital. On digital, across Europe, um, there is so much potential which today is unused uh, at the level of our millions of SMEs. Uh, SMEs are very far from having digitalized their processes, uh, digitalized uh, their, their business plans and made the best uh, of them. And this is not related mostly to the availability of broadband. It is related uh, to, uh, again, an innovative mindset uh, and uh, and an interest for the opportunities of uh, the future. So cohesion policy, I would say, and we would expect that smart specialization will indeed continue to um, uh, to to um, stimulate that. Cohesion policy is there to um, ensure uh, the the sufficient uh, diffusion of um, uh, of um, uh, results of research uh, and and some uh, innovation breakthroughs. Um, thank you. And I think related to this um, 
um, engagement with smart specialization as well with the transitions more in general, um, there needs to be um, capacity in the public sector. And we have a question related to this uh, from Alison Hunter in the audience, who is asking related to the three messages you 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 mentioned earlier: the need to to be quick, the longer long term thinking, um, and leaving no one behind. What is the role of governance models? to drive this kind of transformations and to successfully engage with these transformations. And in particular, what is the role of DG reform in this, uh, which is kind of a novelty, and how does this relate to cohesion policy? Um, what we are seeing, I think, uh, is that um, quality of public administration is um, one uh, contributing determinant uh, of um, economic and social uh, development. And we are seeing, when looking objectively across Europe, that there are huge disparities in terms of quality of public administration. And by public administration, I don't just mean ministries. I mean uh, all branches um, of, uh, of government, uh, including uh, the uh, judiciary. Um, until now, we, um, or until a few years ago at least, we were not very well equipped to push for uh, improvements in the quality of public administration. Um, it started changing in the context of the economic crisis, and in particular uh, through the initially ad hoc support we put in place uh, for uh, the likes of uh, Greece, Cyprus, and Portugal, notably, where we set up some task forces. And this progressively then um, consolidated into uh, the commission service, which you have mentioned, which is uh, DG uh, reform. The, um, um, the mandate of DG reform is to uh, accompany uh, member states and support member states in properly planning and designing uh, reform, which can be uh, of, um, of any type, but it also includes public administration uh, reform. Uh, and um, I, my understanding from uh, my, colleague, my colleague Mario Nava, who um, is heading uh, DG reform, is that DG reform wants to put um, renewed emphasis on the quality of public administration and how to help uh, member states um, uh, achieve um, uh, some progress uh, there. Uh, the tool uh, which DG reform itself is managing is, um, uh, uh, is one which, again, is rather there to help shape the reforms, but not finance the costs of the reforms themselves. And for the coming few years, the ideal uh, instrument to really much more forcefully support the cost of reform um, would be the recovery and resilience facility. The, the basic concept is that member states should, under that facility, present reform and investment packages. And um, public administration uh, is, uh, to me, a very strong candidate in quite a number of member states uh, to benefit both from reform and from some modernizing um, investments. So I think that uh, with the right um, uh, sequence and combination of instruments, the one managed by DG Reform, in preparing reforms, and then the uh, recovery and resilience uh, facility 
uh, member states uh, will be um, uh, best helped to really uh, achieve uh, some significant improvements uh, in the coming years to um, to an extent uh, which was not possible uh, in the past because our toolbox was not uh, well uh, suited for that. Um, thank you. Um, we have uh, just a couple of questions on uh, the relationship between the recovery and resilience facility and um, other programs, including um, cohesion policy. Um, from Eurocities, uh, Pietro de Villa is asking whether um, the different funding opportunity whether there is a risk of overlapping between the different funding opportunities for example um the recovery facility the facility the cohesion funding react to you um do you see the risk these risks and if if it is the case what kind of measures do you have put in place uh to prevent this overlapping and similarly, uh, Sebastian um, Hitzig, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, is asking a bit more bluntly if there is not a risk that the recovery and resilience facility is used as an alternative to cohesion policy with less strings attached. Um, so to that, I ask, do you see whether there is a, a risk that some projects that might have been funded by cohesion um, would just be moved under um, the recovery and resilience facility, um, which might eventually end up um, to member states using less uh, cohesion funding in, in the next coming years. Um, very good remarks, all of these. Um, let me start with the, uh, with the easier bit. You mentioned the recovery and resilience facility, you mentioned REACT-EU, and you mentioned cohesion policy. Um, REACT-EU has um, a uh, more limited scope, uh, which I think um, um, should avoid um, too much overlap. Um, React EU is there to build the bridge between the um, crisis response measures which we allowed to be financed under the present cohesion policy uh, through proposals we made back in April and which were adopted within one month by Council and the European Parliament. This basically allowed much more flexibility under cohesion policy and to um, uh, finance um, expenditure, which uh, until now was uh, off limits, uh, like uh, a lot of um, testing equipment or protective equipment in the health sector, uh, or like um, um, working capital uh, support for SMEs. Um, react EU will, uh, allow to continue to do that, to build the bridge to uh, the 2021-2027 uh, period uh, under normal cohesion policy rules. And normal cohesion policy rules, in fact, will not allow for supporting working capital, for instance, to SMEs uh, anymore. So there, I think uh, the the identity and specificity of react eu is such that um the risk of overlap is um uh, is minimal um the story is very different when it comes to um the recovery and resilience facility as compared to cohesion policy there a priori uh, the overlap is uh nearly um um entire 100 percent whatever you can finance under cohesion probably you can finance under different conditions uh, under the um uh, recovery and resilience facility uh, as well uh, but here i i would want to draw again attention to uh the underlying uh, conditionality under, let me call it RRF because it's it's shorter, under the RRF. It is that 
you cannot just go for funding of projects. You have to have a reform component. We are talking about reform and investment packages. It will be for member states to uh, come up with such packages, so to design them themselves, but um, it will be for the Commission to uh, evaluate whether, whether these are convincing packages, uh, whether the reform part of it uh, brings uh, sufficient um, gains, sufficient uh, European added value. And this approach is therefore very, very different from what we have under cohesion policy. We have a very different type of conditionality under, uh, under cohesion uh, policy. We look at investment projects, let's say, uh, in the transport sector, and we, uh, through the conditionalities under cohesion, we just ensure that these projects fit in a national transport strategy. Just a simple uh, example. Um, so the approach overall is um, is very different. So one can and should anticipate that investments which will be supported under uh, the RRF will be, in many cases, similar to the ones which will be supported under cohesion policy. I would anticipate that the RRF will finance um, a lot when it comes to transport infrastructure, uh, that uh, the RRF will finance a lot um, renewable energies, will finance a lot energy efficiency measures, and cohesion as well. Which brings me to the question of, uh, you know, let, let's use a, a, a quite a crude term, uh, the question of a possible cannibalization um, uh, of uh, one instrument by the other, uh, or a siphoning off of projects uh, which would normally have been supported under cohesion policy uh, under uh, under the the RRF. Here um, we have to keep in mind that the timeline of the two instruments will also be different. The RRF has to complete its operations by the end of 2026. Cohesion policy operations will run until the end of 2029, i.e. There, there are three more years to complete uh, projects uh, and implementation under, under cohesion policy than under uh, the RRF. So, um, independently of whether member states would find the conditions, the conditionality under the RRF uh, more or less easy than under uh, cohesion policy, I think that this very, this very practical constraint will um, uh, influence and should influence the thinking of member states. So, if they have some uh, very um, immediately ready projects, um, uh, which they think uh, can be completed within the coming six years, uh, it is uh, perfectly legitimate for them uh, to think of uh, having them financed uh, under, uh, under the, the RRF. Um, the size uh, of investments might also play uh, a role. Let's not forget that under the uh, RRF, there is no national co-financing foreseen. So, um, uh, you you can finance a project entirely uh, by uh, the European support, while under cohesion policy, you always need to provide some national contribution uh, to uh, to projects. So here again, depending on the type of project, on the type of beneficiary promoter of the project, uh, the um, this difference might play a role in the decision. Uh, from uh, which uh, instrument to to have it um, uh, to have it financed, but overall, I think that these comments um, uh, should uh, indeed remind us all uh, of the fact that these instruments will also only be able to do their magic 
if um, there are a sufficient number of projects around. I already mentioned uh, these very impressive uh, figures um, in, uh, in macroeconomic terms uh, for countries like Bulgaria and Croatia. This will mean that Bulgaria and Croatia will have to sustain some public investment levels year after year of somewhere between at least 4 and 5% of GDP, which is a very high level. And for that to be sustainable, they indeed need to, uh, uh, to, to, to put a lot of focus uh, on the preparation uh, of projects, especially uh, projects of an infrastructural type, which take, um, uh, which take some time. Um, thank you for this. I want to uh, pick up on something you said on reforms, um, and I'll do that before I, I take a question from someone on the floor that I see they have their hand up. Um, but let me pick up on reforms, uh, because we have uh, received some questions on the role of the European semester and the role of country specific recommendations and how this will fit with the recovery and resilience plans, which, um, if I'm not mistaken, will sort of replace uh, the specific recommendations. Um, what is the role of the European semester in this? And, and someone from the audience was saying, uh, Ian Welker, that the country specific recommendations uh, tend not to be detailed enough, um, for example, not covering all sectors. So um, is this going to change when we talk about the recovery and resilience um, facility and, and, plan and related plans? Um. Well, for those who really want to uh, dive into the um, um, uh, into the details of this, uh, I think that uh, the uh, annual sustainable growth strategy, which the Commission adopted last week, uh, offers um, uh, full insight uh, into uh, into our thinking. Um, the country specific recommendations which were made um, both in 2019 uh, and in 2020 um, are um, i would say the uh, starting point um, for member states uh, reflections they are not uh, the uh, sole reference point and in that uh, i think um, everyone can be reassured that while indeed csrs do not cover all subjects under the sun uh, the csrs uh, will uh, not limit the scope uh, of for reform and investment packages uh, which member states uh, will be able to uh, put forward. But we would certainly expect that member states would take the existing CSRs from 2019 and 2020 very seriously and would, um, at least in a good part, suggest to address them in one way or another as part of their recovery and resilience plans, which will include these reform and investment uh, uh, packages. Uh, so the role of the, of the European semester, in a way, uh, is um, uh, has already played out. We are talking about CSRs which emerged from the normal um, um, workings of the European semester. When it comes to the future, um, and there again, the annual sustainable growth strategy of last week makes this plain, we will indeed um, introduce a pause because we want member states to be allowed to um, put all their energy and reflection time into the best possible uh, design of, um, of the uh, recovery plans. Uh, and therefore, we do not want to burden 
also ourselves, I must say, or national uh, public administrations with the heavy um, European semester uh, process uh, as it traditionally um, uh, unfolds. Um, and so we will not provide new country specific recommendations um, in the um, uh, in the spring. Uh, so this you and everyone can be uh, can be reassured of, um, except uh, when it comes to the um, uh, to to the uh, fiscal CSR, which is a, a legal requirement. That's the uh, that's the only uh, exception under the uh, Stability and Growth Pact, but um, uh, but nothing else. Uh, so um, both at the level of member states administrations and at the level of the Commission, the coming months uh, will be uh, devoted to discussing uh, recovery plans of individual member states and eventually getting them adopted. Uh, hopefully, um, uh, early in uh, 2021. Um, thank you. Uh, we just have a few minutes left, so apologies if I won't be able to to get all uh, to get to you all the questions we we received from the audience. But I want to to take one question orally from the audience um, from uh, Zoltan Gieve, who had his hand up for a while. Um, Zoltan, you should be able to speak now. Yes. Very much yes. so, Tanjiva. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hello, Mark. Uh, I'm a, a correspondent of Brooks Info, Hungarian journalist from Brussels. We have seen each other many times uh, since I cover cohesion policy as well. My question is about long term and the possible controversy between long term and short term. In an ideal world, this RRF money funds will be, of course, spent for green and uh, digital transition, but we know also that member states need to boost their economy in short term. Don't, don't you think so that more, most of the member states will have, will have, you would like to submit plans and investments and reforms which are more rather going back in time. So focusing on those investments which are not, uh, let's say, uh, which are a bit in contrast with the new objective. So I see some kind of controversies here because the time, as you said, in order not to waste time, at the same time to spend the money for green and, uh, and digital transition. The other, my other question is about uh, this possibility, this danger uh, which arises, as you said as well, that there will be a kind of correlation of different programs at the same time. If you see that we still have not spent all the money between 2014 and 20, you said that you, almost half of the money is still there, not was not paid out. We will we will have the uh, cohesion policy entering the new one, and then we will have the RRF as well. Huge amount of money. Uh, it raises the question of absorption capacity. How the Commission will ensure that Bulgaria, Croatia, Hungary, and other countries, which are not champions, I would say, in, when it comes to absorption, they will really use this money. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, what is the term which uh, has been used already for for a number of um, of months now uh, in in the public debate um, in the context of our efforts to recover? It is build back better. Um, and I will not repeat uh, the quotes from uh, President uh, von der Leyen, uh, but I think uh, the message is consistent and is it, it is clear. We cannot afford to go for short-term recovery at all costs. We need to, yes, succeed uh, in, the, in a quick rebound, in a quick recovery, but it must also be a chosen recovery, um, bringing us uh, on the path to our uh, long-term goals. And here, I honestly do not see this tension between uh, the long-term and, and the short-term. 
I mentioned that we are supporting quite massively now, and it also relates to your absorption capacity question. We are supporting quite massively now working capital for SMEs. We are supporting massively short time work schemes so that basically employees are not laid off so that for the employer, the wage uh, bill is lowered and uh, for the employee, the salary still is remains uh, remains the same uh, so that we can hoard, uh, as economists say, the um, uh, um, uh, the, the labor force and keep them uh, in in jobs. All of this is meant to um, uh, to to uh, to have a better starting point for the eventual recovery, avoiding bankruptcies uh, and uh, avoiding uh, people being stuck in unemployment for months, if not um, uh, if not uh, years. All this is fine. All these are short-term short measures which we are supporting quite massively now through the 2014-2020 uh, cohesion policy uh, in particular. Assuming that we will have at least a partially V-shaped recovery, meaning that 2021 will uh, show a significant uh, bounce back uh, towards um, uh, pre-crisis um, levels of uh, of activity, that is when the new means we are talking about will start becoming av available. I said more or less mid 2021. If we lose no time along uh, along the way, and it is these means um, about which member states need to reflect very very seriously, and why I again emphasize that long-term thinking is um, is required. And very honestly, why do I say that I don't see this, uh, this tension between long-term and, and short-term? Um, we are not, um, we, we have technologies which today are absolutely fit for purpose to um, progress towards our long-term goals. You know, I, I mentioned renewables. Honestly, uh, today, uh, wind energy, even solar energy, all that is, um, uh, is quite competitive uh, with uh, fossil uh, fuels. Um, another question is hydrogen. Hydrogen is something which still uh, requires maturing but where we believe as part of an industrial policy as well that uh, it has to be part of uh, the probable solutions for full decarbonization of the economy think i don't know uh, airline industry think heavy industry in cement in uh, in steel and so on hydrogen looks like uh, a promising uh, avenue uh, in order to eventually uh, decarbonize uh, these sectors. So there, uh, clearly, it would not be about rolling out of mature green hydrogen, as it's called. We don't have it today. We do not have the technologies today. It would more be about um, moving towards this uh, maturity of the technology through a collective um, uh, industrial uh, industrial ambition. And there we see that member states are in fact interested in doing that, uh, uh, notably through the uh, through the RRF uh, in in the future. And then I would also um, say that while a lot of focus should be put on um, progressing towards our green targets, and as you probably know, for the RRF, for instance, we have proposed that at least 37% of the spending uh, should go towards climate um, uh, climate action. Um, this does not mean, um, a contrario, uh, that the 63 remaining percent uh, have uh, to, to be also focused on that, all to the contrary. But there is this one principle which we propose, which is meant uh, to uh, also avoid uh, this kind of tension between short-term and long-term you, uh, you have mentioned, 
which is the uh, do no uh, significant harm uh, principle. Uh, so this uh, we will want uh, to, um, uh, to see applied by member states, i.e. they should not uh, be looking at uh, quick projects uh, which would go counter to um, our long-term objectives uh, and which would basically um, um, very quickly uh, be transformed into stranded assets which we would have to uh, to abandon. I don't remember now if I if I referred in my uh, introduction to a um, an article from the Financial Times two or three days ago, where the it was a, a comment um, uh, by a Financial Times uh, analyst um, who was um, warning against the RRF becoming hostage to a typical U.S. phenomenon. Uh, called pork barrel politics. So, uh, and I think his warning is absolutely correct. If we are not focused on the long term, if we allow member states to fill their reform, uh, their, their recovery and resilience plans with pet projects from the past, which never found their way into um, uh, into uh, national budgets uh, because there weren't any means and so on, and which now and who now would see the opportunity to have an easy way of funding these projects, then I think we will totally fail. We will totally fail in uh, achieving uh, a sustainable recovery, and we will totally fail in uh, getting. Uh, closer uh, to the um, uh, to the um, indispensable goals uh, which we have set ourselves uh, for the future. On absorption capacity, I would just refer telegraphically back to um, two elements which have already been mentioned. One is um, uh, support for um, uh, preparing uh, rich and mature project pipelines. Their member states have means at their uh, disposal. It's called technical assistance. Um, and, uh, and here it is a question uh, of them also thinking long term uh, so that they don't run out of projects. Uh, and secondly, indeed, generally quality of public administration uh, on which um, uh, for which we will have much better tools uh, in the future. Um, thank you, Mark, for this for these answers. Um, we have used all of our time, so um, I would have to close the session. Um, thanks to the audience for a very good um, participation and interaction. Unfortunately, I, we cannot touch on all the questions we received. Apologies for that, but um, I think nonetheless we had a very interesting discussion. Um, thanks uh, to Mark Lemet for that. Um, we have touched on the broader picture, the vision for the future, but also on details on the implementation um, of this very um, unexpected um, and unprecedented opportunity for reform, for investment. Um, and as I, I must recall that the, the aim of this is that recovery is not just short term, but it's long term, inclusive, sustainable, uh, long lasting. Um, recovery and prosperity for the future of, of the EU. Um, thank you very much uh, to Marc Lemaitre for uh, being very clear um, with us today. Um, I wish you all a good evening and uh, I will see you soon at the future EPC policy brief briefings. Um, thank you, Marc. Thanks uh, to the audience. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for your interest. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.